I'll just basically do what I did with the atheists, return the critical historical thinking back on Roman and Eastern claims, not grant them, nor grant the presuppositions underlying them. And I'd analyze it accordingly. And sure enough, I found, well, they're kind of building and building their claims on the foundation of sand. Welcome back, everybody. My name is Javier Perdomo, and this channel is a place where I like to do theology videos, church history videos, uh, and really Protestant apologetics is what we've been doing for a while. Uh, I know with our guest today, the fact that I'm saying Protestant apologetics would be kind of kind of funny here. <laughs> I'm sure we'll talk about it in a second. But uh, with me today, um, I have someone uh, who I'll introduce in a second uh, as we do this interview. If you're new to the channel, I like to do interviews like this where we cover the stories of people that went from maybe one tradition of Christianity to another, or in some cases, someone who went from being an atheist to a particular Protestant tradition. And we like to cover especially stories of people that struggled with the claims of Roman Catholicism, or people that uh, maybe they didn't struggle, who ran into those claims and had to evaluate them and had to see how they went about it. Because I know there's a lot of people at home that have anxiety about whether or not they should be a part of Rome, or they should be a part of the East, or which one is the one true church. And we want to be able to uh, really platform these either conversion stories or stories of people that didn't convert to Rome in the East and just stayed where they are uh, in, the, in the denomination they were born into. Uh, just because we want to highlight the fact that, you know, this isn't a, a one-way street where people just start looking into Rome or the East and they immediately convert, <laughs> you know. And so we want to help uh, platform these stories. And maybe you at home, if you're dealing with this, you get to hear about how other people went about dealing with this stuff, how other people went about evaluating the evidence. And hopefully that'll be helpful. And so with that, today we have uh, my friend Paul, or as you'll see on the screen, The Other Paul. Paul runs a YouTube channel called The Other Paul, in which he does interviews as well as original presentations on history, theology, and politics. He really focuses on church history. And Paul has been a growing up-and-comer in the Roman Catholic and Protestant debate scene for quite a while. So it's a treat to have him on the show. How are you doing, Paul? Thanks for having me, Javier. Uh, it's a lovely um, 12 a.m. here in Australia, so I'm loving it. In, in the fake time zone, I understand. What'd you say? As a, you're living in the time zone. No, I understand. You know? <laughs> yeah, but I, it's like every time I say a Protestant on one of these interviews or every time I put it on a title, I'm like, I can I can feel Paul shaking his head. As, <laughs> you're not wrong about that. As this is done, but... All right, so uh, for anyone that's new at home, the format that we're going to do here, as always, is I'm going to uh, subtract myself here in a second. I'm going to let Paul tell us his story about how he came to Christ, uh, how he uh, went from the tradition, uh, if we can call it that, that he originally was in, and then how he ended up as a convinced Anglican, and how he ended up dealing with Rome in the, in the midst of all of that. And so with that, Paul, I'm going to go ahead and subtract myself, and any further ado, I'll let you get to your story. Excellent. Thank you, Javier. Well, uh, what I love about this opportunity is that I've talked a fair bit in little bite-sized pieces in various streams of mine uh, on my channel and elsewhere about little bits of my journey here and there over time, um, but I've never actually given the full story from A to Z. And so I think this is actually a really good exclusive uh, here on Javier's channel to actually give my full where am I coming from? Uh, where have I come from? And God willing, where is it going to lead me to? Um, and well, God willing, I'm already settled there uh, where I will be uh, for the rest of my life. Um, so to commence with, I was born and raised in an independent Pentecostal church uh, for the first stage of my life. Um, and it, it was very, very Pentecostal, we're talking. So like second generation type Pentecostal, very, very hardcore, all into signs, wonders, miracles, spiritual warfare, etc. Um, even I, as a baby, was called to be a prophet by the uh, by the elders there. Um, so, depending on your theology and all that, take with that take make of that what you will. Um, but my family eventually moved us to Hillsong around 2010, 2011. So it's still Pentecostal, but more the third gen type, which is much more uh, marketized, much more in sync in many ways with current uh, culture and what have you. And I stayed there until 2021, so around a bit over 10 years. Um, now, one of the key important starting points in my life was in 2017 when I did a diploma of leadership, 
which was effectively year one of a Bachelor of Theology at Alpha Crucis College, which is a Pentecostal Bible college here in Australia. And then from 2018 to the end of 2019, that's when I did my Bachelor of Theology proper. Um, and that was the time when I did start to take theology much more seriously, of course. So as one example, I used to be quite fascinated with Molinism. I was not a fan of Calvinism. I wasn't a raging anti-Calvinist or anything, but I was just like, yeah, no, I don't believe this stuff. And I was very fascinated with the uh, with the idea of Molinism because I did have that presupposition that I wanted to preserve a libertarian human will, um, but in some cool fancy thing that manages to reconcile it with the sovereignty of God. So I took like a very, very, very surface level interest with Molinism, um, but I eventually came to be generally reformed slash Calvinist, if you will, um, just through reading scripture. And actually, I'll, I'll actually say someone who opened it up quite a bit to me was Dr. James White. Like he just gave it straight up and I was like, huh, you know what? <laughs> He's actually right about these passages. So I just casually accepted it because um, by then I wanted, to, I wanted to adopt that mindset of just, it's a, it's a bit of a cliche, you know, you hear, you can hear pseudo intellectual say it all the time, but I, I, I'm, I like to think I'm actually serious about it of wherever the truth is, you just go there, follow wherever the evidence decisively points you. And so that's what I did. I kind of just took it in easily that way because of that. Um, but 2017 was also the year where I had like a big, big, big crisis of faith, uh, biggest one I ever had. Really, well, really, really, my only massive one, and it was, and it was big. I, um, I came quite close to apostasy actually, and that was from doing these deep dives into like niche anti-Christian polemics, you know, especially regarding like the historicity of Holy Scripture, the, especially the Gospels and what have you. And so I wasn't settling for like the the popular popular tier guys like Bart Ehrman, you know, like people like to bring him like, oh, he's the great critic of Christianity. But I was like, no, no, no. There's definitely some more niche guys out there um, who are not as well known, but they're like way more thorough. And sure enough, there were. And because I jumped right into them at the age of 17 with barely any academic training at all, um, I got overwhelmed pretty quickly. So I nearly completely lost my faith in that. But uh, by God's grace, I just decided at one point just to do one simple thing. And that was to take that air of just to ignore the air of, Oh, look how academically neutral and ideologically neutral and intellectual we are. And you Christian apologists are just biased. I decided just to ignore that air completely and just apply their own critical thinking back on them and their claims. And sure enough, my faith was just instantly revived like that because their arguments felt like a house of cards. Once I actually turned their th critical thinking back on them. Um, so through that, that would actually give me a major drive to want to, over the years, study ancient history as a discipline. Uh, and that would be very important for even my interactions with Rome. Um, and so uh, over time at Hillsong, I would become more and more jaded with the concert worship there. My initial plan was to stay at Hillsong and to like reform from within. Um, but for the sake of my own spiritual health, I just... I just needed to leave. That's when, that's when I left in uh, early 2021. Um, I still, it's not, not that I was like naive and then I got black pilled later and I was like, Oh, there's no hope for Hillsong. No, no, no. There's, there's, there's always, there's always hope for reform with people, at least within the institutions to bring him to uh, a more faithful, more historic form of Christianity. So I still hold out that hope, but it was just for my own spiritual health. I needed to find somewhere else. Um, but, a bit before then, and sorry if the story is a little bit multifaceted because multiple things kind of happen at once. Um, my first serious encounter with Romanism was in 2018. So in the middle of my studies, after my crisis of faith, but in the middle of my studies, um, when I, uh, well, I first met a, a group of Romanists um, from, from a Facebook ad, funnily enough, calling for people to help defend uh, St. Mary's Cathedral in Sydney. Uh, during the Mardi Gras parade that goes through Sydney because uh, there was a history of uh, of uh, people in the parade defacing the cathedral. And so I was like, hey, this sounds like fun. So I decided to go there um, as like an informal, like with a bunch of other Romanist guys there, uh, informal defense around the cathedral. Met a few of them there. Um, the week, uh, I then learned from one of them that the next week after was going to be... Um, was going to be a, a, a big, big pro-life march in the city around the same area. Uh, so I decided to go to that as well. Um, <laughs> a bit of an embarrassing thing from that. I don't, I don't know if I'll, you know, um, I, might, I might save it for another time. There's a bit of an embarrassing thing in that with me, but whatever. That happened. 
um, pro-life march. And after that is when I met a bunch of these other Romanists um, in the Sydney circles. And then, and they're not they're not just your regular like either liberal or just casual Romanists. They're, they're actually all proper trads who I met. Um, so these ones I met the week before and the ones I met at this pro-life march after the fact, that would basically be the building blocks of what would be the wider Romanist friend circles that I have here in Sydney to this day. Um, but one of them in particular I would meet, um, and I'll, I have to say that she is probably one of the decisive formative influences on me doing what I do today and studying what I have today. Um, because I eventually met up with her a couple of times. She's a bit older than me. It was it wasn't like any romantic interest or anything. It was just genuinely like, hey, you're you're Romanist. I'm a prot. So let's talk about some stuff. So we hung out twice. Um the first time in particular was the most important and the most embarrassing because I had done like casual reading on apologetics against Rome uh in the meantime. And I thought, oh yeah, I'm gonna have a I'm gonna have a good back and forth with her. She just completely trounced me entirely. And, and so <laughs> it may be hard to believe that I, the other Paul, would get trounced so bad in, in such a rudimentary way. But <laughs> it, it was on two major issues. It was on the Deuterocanon and it was on the Eucharist in particular and, and John chapter 6. So <laughs> I asked, uh, she asked me rather, um, why, don't you, why do you not believe the Deuterocanon is scripture? And I kid you not, and it, it it kills me to repeat what I said. I said to her, uh, because they were written in the intertestamental period. And she was absolutely baffled by that answer. And anyone with two minutes experience in these debates should be as well. <laughs> completely question begging, completely nonsensical. That's uh, absolutely incredible. Um, and then she kept going on a longer thing about, oh, look, John chapter six, it uh, the Greek word used for flesh is socks, and it means real flesh, therefore transubstantiation. And I was just kind of nodding along like, uh-huh, uh-huh, okay, mm, interesting. Didn't have any counters at all. Never never got into this stuff live with anyone. So I was just completely, completely whooped by that <laughs> entirely. Um, but that gave me the further resolve to actually study these issues more deeply because it's a because it's a matter of truth. Um, and so if I'm wrong about these, I want to know if I'm wrong. Uh, but at the same time, and this is definitely an act of God's grace that I had this mindset right there from the get-go back in 2018, um, I'm not just going to grant their readings and interpretations of sources. I'm not, well, I'm not just going to take their interpretations for granted. Um, I'm going to actually investigate them deeply myself, uh, see if there's other ways to understand it, see if there's better ways to understand these sources. Um and so, sure enough, that's what would end up happening. In particular, I took an interest on the issues of like apostolic succession, for example. Uh, and that was one of my first major things of reading patristic sources that were given as proof texts by Romanists, doing my own study with them and concluding that, no, their interpretation is wrong. Um, because it, even if at that point I hadn't exactly had like a rigorous training in historical method or what have you, uh, I still had some basic principles of it in mind with respect to interpreting texts and uh, not reading things in, at least not deliberately reading things into that text um, and having a critical eye for what is within it. And so I'd look at these texts uh, and obviously I looked at other Protestant apologetic stuff as well. And I'd say what they say and that they helped out a lot. Um, but I'd say stuff like they'd say Irenaeus and they say, Oh, look, apostolic succession. And I gave the, I would discern that, well, no, for, Irenaeus, his emphasis wasn't quite the idea of this sacramental passing thing office on in and of itself. It was the fact of passing on the teaching, which is a distinct thing. Now, of course, as an Anglican, I do affirm some sense of apostolic succession, but the question regards the significance of it in the early apologists, but that's going to go on a longer tangent. Um, in any event, that would that would go on from that time, basically up till today, where I'd study, uh, I'd look at the apologetics of both sides and, and I'd try to go to the best of both sides. I wouldn't settle for the pop level. Um, and as well as, of course, looking at the sources myself, making my own decisions, because I came to that resolve as well, that I'm going to be most secure in what I believe and what I argue when I actually discern those things from the sources themselves and not just rely 
on other people to tell me what they think. <clears throat> and that would eventually crystallize in more recent times into my own conviction where I won't speak with confidence on things unless I've personally had acquaintance with the primary sources, even if they're things which are seemingly common knowledge, like 101 for most people, when they're historical claims, I will still, the vast majority of the time, just say, um, well, as far as I'm aware of this, but I'm not going to say it conclusively. Um, that's just how seriously I want to take the obligation of reading the sources, studying them myself. Um, so that continue that obviously continues uh, to this day. Um, however, and, and by the way, one of those Protestant resources that I'd look at that really, really helped me a lot um, would be a great website called Triablog, um, T-R-I-A-B-L-O-G-U-E. Uh, it's run by a small team of guys. Um, a couple of guys in particular would deal with Rome's claims and they, they, their material is very, very, very good. And that helped me a lot um, in this journey. But uh, eventually I would actually start my channel actually back in 2019 or around there. Um, but I wouldn't really, um, I wouldn't really make any content on it just because I was too busy with study with my bachelor of theology at the time. Um, but come summer break of 2020, uh, summer break during a master's of secondary teaching, which I was doing, but I didn't end up finishing. Um, during that summer break, I decided, you know what, this channel project, I want to be serious about it. So let's take advantage of it. Let's get it happening. And so sure enough, summer break 2020 and summer for us is at the end of the year, by the way, for the, for the Americans out there. Um, that's when I decided to get the channel content rolling out. And that's when my first stuff started to come out. Um, and I wanted my channel generally, and it's still the goal to this day, basically just to be um, a link <clears throat> between academic tier biblical theological study presented to laymen in a very easily understandable and digestible way. That was my whole aim with the channel. And even my original slogan was good apologetics requires good theology, uh, precisely because I, was, I basically in the past got burned. Um, even after my cross of faith, I got burned by like apologetics arguments from the Christian side, but they're, ma they're made on the basis of really bad and malformed theology. And so my channel, I designed it to be a counteraction to that, where it provides solid theological bases upon which then apologists can actually build on top of that. And very early on, um, I would do other issues, and I still obviously do issues that aren't related to Rome, but very early on, I would address Roman stuff. One of my first ever videos was, in fact, a response to an article asserting that Luke chapter 1, verse 28, proves the Immaculate Conception. And I was like, no, it doesn't. Went into the Greek because it tries to make a Greek argument from it, because by that point... In my bachelor, I had studied Greek as well, so I was able to do that. Um, but yeah, that was the that was the aim of my channel when I began to actually do these things. Um, now, finally, going back to when I left Hillsong, and this is where we actually get to the Anglicanism part for me. Um, I left it in early twenty one, and I was and I just wanted to find any kind of faithful church. I, I wasn't, I, I didn't research a different quote unquote, Protestant traditions and find, hmm, I like this one the best. I, I, I honestly didn't care a whole lot which one I was going to find. I just wanted to find one that was faithful, um, particularly in the context of the whole COVID stuff and the lockdowns in Australia, which were pretty bad here in Sydney. Um, because a few weeks into my search after I left Hillsong, the hard lockdown happened and that included many ch like churches being shut down basically. Um, and so, and, and so even after that lockdown ended, I was still looking for a church. And so I didn't have a church for something like a year, basically from early 2021 to the beginning of 2022, uh, around May, 2022, actually. Um, and so again, I didn't care what tradition in the end I was going to find just as long as it was going to be a faithful Protestant church, um, and my initial preference was actually for like a like a traditional Presbyterian church to attend to. But by providence, I would actually, <laughs> funnily enough, of all places, I would be at a Romanist friend's birthday party. And there was a and there was a bunch of Romanist friends there as well. Um, and I would be talking with one of them in that party about Romanist versus Protestant issues. Um, 
And then this, and then this other young woman, uh, a few years older than me, she walks up to us and she says, Hey guys, can I just sit here and just listen in, uh, on what you guys are saying? Cause this stuff interests me. And so I, uh, almost immediately actually just pivot over to talking with her. And she tells me that she was actually a born and raised Romanist still goes to mass, but she's starting to doubt Rome's claims on grace and justification. And so she tells me she's simultaneously going to an Anglican church. And so I ask, her, oh, wow, okay, which one is this? She tells me where it is. I look it up and I realize, oh, it's this old building that's actually quite near me. And I didn't think it was even a functioning church. And so I think, you know what, I'm looking for a church. Why not? I'll give it a go next Sunday. So sure enough, I visit there on Sunday and I just immediately think it's home. Yep, that's it. This, this is my home because it had both uh, contemporary service with a lot of young people, which I I wasn't as much of a stickler for traditional worship as I was then. I, I did prefer that, much prefer some kind of traditional worship, but in like a traditional Presbyterian kind of way. That was my initial preference. But otherwise, I didn't care a huge amount as long as they were actually faithful. Um, although, of course, I would grow in my emphasis on good liturgical worship in the future. But in any case, at the time, I just thought it was home because it did have the contemporary service, but it also had a more traditional service and it, and it still does, of course. Um, and so that was also the very week where I actually did my uh, stream on my channel reacting to the 39 articles of religion. So that was actually right when I first found this church because I decided I immediately committed to it. And because I'm a man of principle, I thought, okay, let's look at their confessional documents. Let's see what they actually say, if I can actually affirm this. And in that stream from memory, <clears throat> I was able to affirm the, major the vast majority of it, except likely for what it said about baptism and the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist. Um, God's, uh, God be praised. I would eventually um, change my opinion on those. And now I, uh, I'm in, in line with those, um, with the articles in the belief of sacramental efficacy in baptism and some true sense of Christ's presence in through the Eucharist. Um, but in any case, at the time, that's when I found the Anglican tradition. And I, at, at, at first, again, it, it wasn't because I was just looking for like, oh, what's the best Protestant tradition? It was just finding any Anglican church. Oh, sorry, any Protestant church, any faithful church. And so I went to this church, made it my home. And I only looked at the articles after the fact to see, well, can I affirm this? Can I in good conscience uh, uh, visit? Uh, sorry, attend this place. And so I accepted the majority of them. Um, and that's when I started to have more discussions with uh, fellow Anglicans that I knew, including Father James or Belly Protestant on YouTube. Um, and over time, I would grow and grow and grow into my appreciation of the Anglican tradition until now. It's, it's at this point now, especially for the past few months, it's basically been a absolute landslide of just... I love this tradition. I genuinely believe it was a thing of divine providence that led me here, that the Anglican tradition truly is the most superior expression of the Christian faith and the one that is most conducive to a genuine pan-Christian unity. And so I've been, again, past few months, absolute landslide in delving into this, into this tradition and uh, extracting all the sources from our history. And, um, so I thank God for that. And that leads us to now to what I'm doing now and for my channel that whole time from before going to that church till now I had been doing, and I have been doing stuff on apologetics with Rome and the East, <clears throat> but I genuinely believe it's now since adopting the unconstitution. Um, I, I had the trouble of just having this because, uh, cause again, I'll still kind of churchless for a while uh or pentecostal and so i was affirming a kind of pan protestantism kind of thing but now that i'm actually anglican i my apologetics has now since become much more principled much more rooted um and so now i can actually point to a very particular expression of the christian faith which i genuinely believe to be the most authentic expression and i can point to that and say this is the truth and i can argue for that and so that, in sum, is my story. All right. That was cool, man. Hearing the, uh, you know, the other Paul lore 
for the <laughs> pool for the first time. That's the but, way. By the way, to uh, uh, before we get into a few questions here, to something that you just said here at the end, what, what I find fascinating is, uh, uh, as as you also know, right? I've been looking at a lot of Lutheran sources, and I'm and I'm kind of trying to figure stuff out on, on that end of the uh, of things as well. But I remember one time, like uh, a month, month and a half ago. Uh, um, where I, I got to sit down with my uh, one of my best friends is Roman Catholic. I got to sit down with him and uh, uh, finally like have another one of our like like classic debates on the you know which I, I was like man I'm so starved of this We're looking into this stuff for him uh, and one of these in a long time and the reason that we sat down to do that is because we were at a at a hangout with one of his um, uh, uh, this guy that was non denom and he converted him to Roman Catholicism. And so that guy started engaging with me. And so my friend kind of went into like, okay, well, we got to sit down, we got to handle this. <laughs> and and what's, what, what was really cool is I allowed myself for that night to just like, you know, I argued like a Lutheran would argue. And that just, yeah, that night panned out really, really well. <laughs> As Good. opposed to uh, the previous times where I, I, I had tried arguing from a Baptist perspective or from a... <laughs> but I try to argue from a Lutheran perspective, just kind of, kind of, kind of, you know, uh, fix things uh, a lot of the way through the apology. I guess to your point, right? Like that good apologetics needs good theology. Um, exactly. But, but with that, so let me get to a few questions here uh, on your story before I get to some of the ones that, that I had uh, kind of thought up beforehand. Um, man, so how was it? Uh, I guess it's a follow up from you going from Hillsong, right, to a really traditional service. So was this how 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 was the shift for you mentally? Because uh, the thing is, one of the things that I, I interestingly enough find really hard for people they're looking at, at these things is a lot of the time. Weirdly enough, I feel like I, I meet people who are like, okay, fair enough. This theology, whether it's Anglican or Lutheran or, or, or you know what, whatever high church kind of setting it may be, they're like, I feel like maybe the theology makes sense, but then for some reason the worship is just like a big deal for them. It's like, all they know is contemporary worship and all they know is like, this is how I connect with God on Sunday morning. And this is like, and, mm -hmm. and it's, you know, <laughs> and it's like a begrudging sort of change for them. Uh, but it sounds like for you, it wasn't right. So was that like a, mm -hmm. like a overnight thing where you were like, Oh, I love contemporary. And suddenly you were like, I love traditional or was it, did it take yeah, a yeah. Yeah, so that was, that was something I kind of alluded to um, in my story. I should have fleshed it out a bit more. But yeah, before I had even left Hillsong and after I left and wanted to look, look for another church, I recognized and believed that more reverent liturgical worship was actually the proper way to go, even if not to the level of like the 1662 BCP with vestments and flailing the incense everywhere. Not quite yet, um, but still something reverent, something liturgical. I genuinely believe that was the proper way of worship. Uh towards the end of my time at Hillsong and after I left and went to search for a place. And so um, actually um, that, and, and my love for liturgy was just growing more and more and more as, as time went on. Um, and so when I first went to this Anglican church and I first experienced its liturgical service and, and, and it's a very stripped back one too. It's not like the, the, the ministers have robes or anything. They don't, it's very stripped back. It's a, it's a stripped back form uh, it's 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 structure is similar to the BCP the the liturgy there, but it's much more stripped back, much more simplified. And, and obviously, I have my it, it irks me a bit. I kind of want it to be like this return to tradition, basically, kind of thing. Yeah. But otherwise, even regardless of that, I went there first time, and since then, I'm just like, I love this. This is exactly what I wanted. So it was the exact opposite, opposite for me. I, as I mentioned in the story. I grew very irked with contemporary concert worship. That, that, that's that's what Hillsong was. And, and by the way, I didn't just go to um, I didn't just go to any Hillsong. I went to the Vatican of Hillsong, like the center of Mother Church, um, and where like Pastor Brian Houston at the time he himself was based there. So I'd see him. I'd see him there quite regularly. Big, big um, building and what have you. And yeah, it was literally a concert every Sunday. Um, and in, in fairness, I pretty much even since I was a young kid when I first started going there, um, I wasn't exactly like an enthusiastic worshiper. I wasn't a kid at the front like, oh, yeah, praise God, like like that every Sunday. I was kind of like, eh, whatever. I'd like the preaching maybe. That would be the thing I'm most interested in, but I wasn't an enthusiastic praiser except for the few times in the year 
like at a certain uh, youth conference or whatever where they where I'd get them like get the high get the high of it all like oh yeah let's experience Jesus and all that you know um and 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 I do genuinely believe that's maybe a story for another time but I do genuinely believe one of those things one of the Hillsong summer camps there was a genuine god moment upon which I hung during my crisis of faith and which stopped me from leaving the faith so I genuinely believe there was a god thing there um but otherwise um, otherwise, yeah, it was a lot of just writing on, it, j- just just writing on the feels. Basically, it was it was feels based uh, pneumatology, um, and so I should, I should coin that phrase. Actually, feels based pneumatology. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Yeah, the Holy Spirit equals your dopamine levels, basically. So that's what I was largely relying on. That's why I never got long term satisfaction from it. Um, but then contrast this now with liturgical worship with a proper view of the sacraments. And now I genuinely feel fulfilled in my faith. Um, in contrast to that. I also, I also feel like, uh, uh, the structure of a lot of contemporary, right? Because I mean, again, I, I've grown up my whole life uh, with, with, well, to, to one degree or another, right? <laughs> in higher and lesser degrees, at uh, contemporary worship. Um, and you have, you have, you know, some songs that are better theologically, but I, I feel like a lot of the time contemporary stuff just ends up being very toned down or very like what, you know, what people commonly call online, like the, like the Jesus is my boyfriend sort of like, <laughs> like lyrics, right? Oh, <laughs> it's man. like vaguely, like if, if, if it wasn't because it's, it has the name Jesus in it, like you could swap out that name for anybody, anybody oh, else's man. name and you could still sing the song. <laughs> Towards <laughs> you know? the end at Hillsong, that got very bad, like really, really bad. Like, I genuinely believe Hillsong has a lot of absolute bangers. And so I, I don't believe they're appropriate for liturgy. No, they're concert stuff. But outside of their context, they have many a fantastic yeah. Christian songs. I genuinely believe that. Some of my favorites still are from Hillsong. But as time went on, uh, a couple of songs in particular, and one song in particular, my word, towards the end before I left, I, I literally remember picture perfect exactly where I was in the church building when they debuted it there in the in the mother church, um, what seat I was in and my exact reaction. When I first heard the opening tunes and the opening lyrics, my jaw physically dropped. And I and I openly said to someone next to me, Is this is this worship or is this my chemical romance? I, I was straight up. It, it, and I don't know if you've heard that song. It's the song that goes all of my best friends are sick of pretend. I I I, I want to oh, die no. of pretend just by just by repeating the lyrics. It is, oh, it is it is so bad. People who heard what I said, they can probably look up the lyrics. It is, it was bad. It in terms of Jesus, my boyfriend type stuff, or just uber contemporary. You can't tell if this is worship or just a concert. That yeah. that was one of the worst vendors. But yeah, so yeah, it got wild. bad towards the end. <laughs> it's wild because I look back at some of my own playlists, like. When I, when I was like in seventh grade or eighth grade <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I go to my first youth camp and like, that's the thing. I would update my playlist every time I went to youth camp mm-hmm. and I listen to the same songs until the next youth camp and then update it again. <laughs> but I, I listen to some of those songs. Uh, every once in a while, I grab that old playlist and I'm just like, Ooh, it's like half the songs on here. I'm like, you, if, if you, if I wasn't a Christian, you had played this for me. <laughs> I just said this is about like literally your girlfriend or your boyfriend. I, I, and, I you could have gotten away probably, with it. You probably also started to think, hmm, that is actually that is actually a uh, monothelite heresy in that in that lyric. <laughs> oh, dude, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's the thing I was gonna say too is I feel like um, once. So one of the cool things with with hymns, and I think there are hymns where you can connect emotionally, and they're very powerful in that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, there's also a lot of hymns where maybe not so much. But one of the things that I think uh, builds, and uh, we'll see if you agree. I think we would. One of the things that builds appreciation for more traditional uh, uh, worship and maybe hymns and stuff like that, um, which you can do with contemporary, just not as common, is just theologically robust lyrics. Right? Yeah, because exactly. You, you get yeah. to a place where like. What, what means a lot to you is the richness of the lyrics to where you're like, man, this is my faith. This is awesome. Versus just like, a, well, I relate to this on a very basic level. <laughs> Emotionally, yeah, exactly. You know? 100%, 100%. But, but yeah, so with that, uh, 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 on to the, 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 the real meat of, of kind of what we wanted to talk about. Um, so 
when you're looking at, at Roman Catholicism right now, you meet these friends, like you're saying, you, these, these are people that you're friends with uh, to this day, and you're having these conversations with them from the very beginning. Um, when you're first met with these things, and you know, like you said, you're like, man, what happened? I just got like demolished. Uh, <laughs> which I think every every uh, apologist in his early days is a couple of those stories of like, oh man, I'm winning hot. <laughs> I went in hot yeah. with um, uh, got questions like articles and things that have out for me. <laughs> I can know? say I never relied on them. I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> but so. But when you first encountered these, right, and you're like, man, I didn't have the answers, I, and you're kind of like really taking their claim seriously, what are some of the things about Roman Catholicism that were most alluring for you, right? And then what did you find so alluring about it? Hmm. Well, I know there's definitely a distinction between, in the questions you gave me, a distinction between alluring versus like most troubling claims. So in terms of alluring, I, I never actually found it alluring. So I'm probably different from most people. I've never actually found a great allure in an absolute sense to Rome, like ever. Now, of course, I can speak in a relative sense. So relatively speaking, the most yeah. alluring things I saw obviously were its, its scale, its seeming stability, which is, yeah, that's probably not the case now. Um, <laughs> just, to, just, to put a, just to put it bluntly, is the Pope Catholic is not a rhetorical question anymore. But anyway, um, that, that stuff... Uh, Rome's voluminous theological output and kind of the, the implied promise to laymen of just being able to like switch off your brain to some extent and just, Hey, just receive what the church says about all these very particular questions. I mean, relatively speaking, I guess if, if I was thinking about it back then, those things would have been the strongest allure, but I, I, I never found them alluring to begin with um, precisely because I didn't care unless it was actually demonstrated to be true, you know? Mm. Um, and even, and even back then I didn't actually have like a big appreciation for aesthetics to a, to a degree, apart from just like, Oh, wow, that looks cool. But in terms of aesthetics as pointing to something or signifying something deeper, I didn't really care a whole ton back then. So even that didn't really pull me apart from when I would eventually visit some local Latin masses, um, at, at a particular church here in Sydney, um, and I'd be like, whoa, and the, the, the scale of it, the smell of incense, whatever. It was, it was pretty epic. And I was kind of like, <laughs> actually, really, really funny story. Where I actually, one of the first times, I don't know if it was the first or the second time I visited the Latin Mass, but I accidentally walked into the confessionary <laughs> oh, <laughs> with other people, where the people in confession were sitting, and they, and they looked at me, and I'm just like, Oh crap! So I just turn the other way and go to the proper pews next time and sit with one of my one of my Romanist Romanist mates, and he's just, he's just chuckling right at me because of it. But uh, yeah, so I visited the Latin Mass a few times, and I did gain an appreciation then for like, wow, this is like in a pure aesthetical sense, it's amazing, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. But then and today, um, I always had a hard distinction between things that look nice and things that actually are true. And so I appreciate, I could appreciate the aesthetic all I wanted that didn't inch me closer to Rome. So in an absolute sense, no, I didn't really get anything alluring to Rome. Well, that's really interesting. Yeah. That's, that's the thing for me too, that, that was really helpful um, as well for me when, when, when I was really struggling with this stuff was constantly asking that question, right? It's like, okay, this sounds great, <laughs> but it, it, you know, whether, whether it looks or sounds great is kind of irrelevant if it's not hmm. true. <laughs> you yeah, know? Exactly. Or, or, that's, or if it's the, that's, the whole, that's, that's the whole social experiment with my man Dogmabot over here. That's the whole thing. It's like, hey, look, it's this robot. You just ask it whatever you want, and it gives you infallible divine revelation. Isn't that so cool? Doesn't that sound amazing? That's great, but it's not true. You know, yeah. that's the whole social experiment. I like to run with this thing. <laughs> yeah, well, and it's a good one because, and something that I I, I talk about a lot in these interviews. Um, so I, I won't go I, I won't go somewhere into it again, but it's. Uh, What's interesting about the meta narrative, right, is that it's super powerful when you're dealing with someone that uh, is maybe they're not very argument oriented, they're not very debate oriented, and then the meta narrative is just like whoa. Uh, like I talked about in last week's interview uh, with uh, 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 Michael uh, Potopotos, he talks about like you know at first for him like Rome was sold as like this like city on a hill, this bastion of truth versus like modernity <laughs> and all that stuff. And then you actually like, you know, you, once you're like, well, hold on a minute, let me actually look into these claims and let me, let me care about the truth uh, and pursue the truth. 
then suddenly, you know, it's 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 not made of solid gold. It's it's kind of gilded, <laughs> and not even gilded yeah. super well, you know. Yeah, um, exactly. And, and so, but I find that interesting. Yeah, you didn't find it super alluring. I feel like for a lot of people, uh, when they first encounter Rome, they look at this like again seeming titan, and they're like, mm -hmm. no, I feel myself like pulled toward it, and they have to fight yeah. against it. Yeah, but. But but that's really interesting. So, so like you said, I I like to separate um, and when I ask these questions in, in these interviews between what is most alluring and then what is most troubling, right? Because sometimes for people, mm -hmm. right, it is alluring to be like, wow, they're they're bashing the truth and they're all solidified and they're awesome. Uh, but for other people, uh, what really gets to them is just like, no, what's troubling to me here is the anathemas, or what's troubling to me are these claims that they make that I that I didn't know how to counter. And these are the mm. things that really got to me. And so which of Rome's claims most troubled you when you were first uh, met with them? And then how did you go about evaluating them? Yeah. So um, for a brief period, very, very, very brief period, like immediately after that conversation, for example, the most troubling things were probably the Eucharist and the Deuterocanon and maybe from memory apostolic succession, because I know that was just one I like to read about a lot. Um, I'm not sure how troubling it was for me, um, but at minimum, the Eucharist and the Deuterocanon were the big ones. Um, but again, it, only for a very brief period, because again, like the the year prior, I had or, I already still had my battle scars from the niche atheist material, yeah. and so I just reapplied the same tools of returning the critical thinking back on their claims, not taking their claims or their presuppositions for granted. Um, and so I analyzed their claims on the Eucharist and the Deuterocanon in their light. And very quickly, I was like, mm, yeah, no, I'm not convinced. Like very frequently, I was like, yeah, they're getting things incorrect. And in fairness, some of my arguments have probably since changed. And like back then for a while, and even a bit after I became Anglican, I was a memorialist straight up with regards to the Eucharist. Not anymore. Um, although nonetheless, I still do believe some of my observations are somewhat accurate in, in, in terms of interpretive issues. Um, but nonetheless, yeah, I'll, I'll just basically do what I did with the atheists, return the critical historical thinking back on Roman and Eastern claims, not grant them, nor grant the presuppositions underlying them. And I'd analyze it accordingly. And sure enough, I found, well, they're kind of building and building their claims on the foundation of sand. Um, and so that's why I never really, I never really, uh, uh, the, the, the trouble, the, the those claims troubling me did not last very long. Um, right. And so it would just basically after that just become, well, okay, let's just keep reading more stuff, what, find out the most I can about these issues, develop the best arguments and what have you. Um, yeah, basically up till to this day. Well, and maybe one of the things we can talk about here, uh, uh, as I referenced it at the beginning, I mean, everyone's aware with uh, your problem with the word Protestant. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, something that I like to, to say, and I don't know, if, I don't know if I read it somewhere or, or if I just made it up. Uh, but is this idea of you know when Rome does the whole like oh to be deep in history it seems to be Protestant, and we're like okay, well obviously that's that's silly and that's just a one liner. But my 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 retort a lot of the time is well to be because some people freak out or they're like well my tradition might be wrong and it's like immediately it's this binary thinking of either the tradition I've been raised in is correct or I need to go to Rome. <laughs> you know, and there's yeah. and there seems like there's no in between. And so my my tagline has kind of become like, hey, uh, it may be true. How, well, it's not true that to be deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. It may very well be true that to be deep in history is to cease to be certain kinds of Protestant. Yeah, exactly. And that's okay, yeah. you know. And, and and I think about that as you talk about like you know some of these issues that you, well they may not have troubled you for long, where at least for a little while you were like, wait a minute, uh, what's going on here? <laughs> Or, or even things like like Zwinglianism, right? Where like you changed your mind, and you're not a Romanist. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, you get what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> and so, I, I, well, well, here's the thing. I'm I I I abandoned memorialism. It's a, it's a bit of a myth that Zwingli, Zwingli himself was a memorialist. He was actually more or less smack bang with John Calvin. Um, but nonetheless, so I abandoned memorialism. I uh, abandoned contemporary worship. I love liturgical stuff now. I'm very comfortable with priesthood language when it comes to uh, pastors themselves. Um, I believe in the sacraments as means of grace, chiefly the Eucharist and baptism. Um, I believe uh, I, I believe in a function of apostolic succession, so not to the same significance, but I still do. 
um, among numerous other things. All these things, which relatively speaking, compared to an evangelical, brings me close to the Rome. Um, where I, where am I now? I am even more fervently anti Roman in terms of my intellectual argumentation than ever. So that just that alone demonstrates that it's a it's a binary that needs to be destroyed. Yeah, and, and I think it's important to break that narrative, right? Because I think that's what really really gets to people. Uh, I remember that's one of the things for me where, and again, I'm, I'm still trying to. Uh, uh, fully uh, theologically sort myself out a little bit here, uh, or denominationally at least. But uh, even with me, that's one of the things that that really helped me uh, back in the day was saying, "Well, wait a minute. Let's say for a second that that uh, uh, Rome is going in the right direction as far as understanding of baptism, or more or less in the right direction in regards to the sacraments." That doesn't mean I I jump from being Baptist to being to being Romanist. It's like hmm. the Anglicans understand the sacrament yeah. as efficacious. Yeah. The the Lutherans understand them as, as efficacious. The Lutherans and and uh, uh, a lot of Anglicans see Christ bodily present in the bread and the wine. They and so once I once you break that the narrative of that binary, I think it really really helps you to to be like okay, let me actually grapple with the specific claims on a claim by claim basis. And and build out uh, you know what the what the proper conclusion should be and just search for the truth in that way because otherwise I feel like binary thinking leads to this like I was wrong on John six I guess I got to submit to the Pope and <laughs> and it's like well wait a minute like <laughs> I feel like a lot of steps have been have been skipped here <laughs> along the way you know and so exactly yeah but so, so then, let me ask you a follow up then so we talked about uh, you know you said that. Uh, um, you then find a lot of things alluring, although in theory, you're like, well, I guess there's some cool stuff there, but it doesn't matter if it's not true, right? That they're base claims. Uh, and you talk a little bit about like, well, how you go about dealing with some of the things that troubled you. And some of those, you even changed your mind, but you changed your mind without becoming a Romanist, right? And so, but it sounds like for this one, I feel like you'd have a, a lot more uh, to say, which is uh, at the height of, you know, you, you looking at the stuff and dealing with the stuff and having conversations with your, uh, with your Roman Catholic friends. Uh, what are some of the features or claims that they have to defend? Some of the features and claims that are like an official part of Roman Catholicism that you never found even the least bit like compelling. Oh, um, mate, excuse me while I bring out the scroll. But yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> man, honestly, mate, many things. And just off the top of my head, like obviously the papacy itself, I've never once grown like any level of being convinced by that at all. Um because again, that was just me applying that historical and critical. I don't want to say historical critical because that is a particular methodology, which is not too nice, but historical and critical thinking, applying that to proof text given, especially, of course, the Locus Classicus, Matthew 16, 18, um, as well as various um, patristic statements, particularly Irenaeus. That's what I found early on too. Um, and just applying that historical and critical method to it um i just saw no that just doesn't pan out to the papacy at all just look just read what the texts say let them inform you and you're not going to get these things out of it um so really it, it, it might seem like a little bit of arrogance on my part but really from the beginning it was just for me like look it is so obviously not saying what you're trying to say to it and and still hearing the arguments to this day whether it's from matthew 16 or irenaeus or um or this figure or that figure um, I, I can understand certain statements later in church history, like say Pope Agatho's letter at Nicaea two, which seem to sound much more like a papal thing. I can, I can understand those kinds of proof texts. Um, but again, ones like the, the, the big ones that have been often referenced, Matthew 16, by, by, by the church of Rome itself, like Matthew 16, um, even in official, if I'm not mistaken, the official relatio, which is the official interpretation of the first Vatican council accepted by the council itself by uh, Bishop Vincent Gasser, uh, he himself references Irenaeus as like a proof for like, oh, look, papacy, the Sea of Rome and all that stuff. And I read Irenaeus, I'm like, well, no, he's not at all giving papal foundations. It's it's rooted in completely different assumptions mm -hmm. from the papal system. And it actually creates a really damning argument from silence. But in any case, that's 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 basically that for the papacy, uh, for the Immaculate Conception. As I, as I mentioned, one of my first ever videos was on the uh, proof text for the Immaculate Conception. Uh, purgatory as well, of course, um, indulgences and what have you. Just name it. And I've, yeah, it, the vast majority of them I never even really came close to. Again, with the exception of those 
initial issues that were thrown in my face, like the Eucharist and uh, the Deuterocanon. Um, but again, even them, I kind of quickly kind of overcame those ones. Um, especially since the Deuterocanon, I take it as like a very largely, there's many adiaphora in that issue. You know, it's not, oh no, you must have a 66 book canon or this one. It's like, no, you can, there's, there's, there's room for, there's room for, uh, for vagueness. But in any case, yeah, in the vast majority of Rome's claims, including its most fundamental claims, I never found them convincing. Yep. Well, and it sounds like a like the like a uniting thread for a lot of these things is just whether they're actually doing proper exegesis or whether mm. they're just proof texting, right? Yeah, which, exactly. which there, there's definitely a difference. <laughs> like with a lot of the Marian stuff, I feel like they're just man, like the amount of stuff you have to read mm. through the text. Yeah. like in an ad hoc manner to, to, to get these things, you know? Exactly. And that was just my biblical theological education. I got through my, well, initially through my bachelor of theology, but then after the fact, through my own continued study as well, just like, look, there's basic principles of interpretation. You've got to follow. You can't just make stuff up, you know? Yeah. And so I just simply applied that to these debates. And I was like, look, I'm just not seeing your claims here. Um, in other things, over time, I'd say, okay, no, you guys are kind of right about that. Like, for example, when Eric Ibarra would talk about how um, 1 Corinthians 10, that points to some sense of real presence in the Eucharist, I would eventually be like, you know what? That is a fair point because the, uh, the thing with a statement like, this is my body, that can be very easily interpreted as a figurative statement. That kind of language can be used in a figurative sense. Um but then for first Corinthians 10, where Paul's saying the bread is a participation in the body. Okay. That's not exactly figurative language anymore. That's, that's, that's being much more specific. Um, so yeah, there's issues where, because again, I'm not just being anti-Romanist for the sake of it. I'm just trying to follow the evidence as it is. And in some issues I would come quote unquote closer to Rome in a way. Um, but of course in the fundamentals that would actually cause me to convert, I haven't. Um, and it's just simply because I look at the evidence they present and I am very disappointed. Yeah. Well, and something that might be helpful also for people at home is even when we say, you know, like, I know for some people it can be like, well, but if I'm going to go closer to Rome on some issues, like, why would I not do the whole thing? And it's, I guess what's interesting here is there's a difference between uh, seeing Rome as the standard that I'm getting closer to and seeing like the truth and the, the, the truth, the positive faith as the standard. And if Rome mm -hmm. just so happens to get some things right, along with the stream that I'm in, and that's yeah. okay. I, I'm yeah. not relative to Rome in that, <laughs> like as the Rome is the standard. It's the deposit yeah. of faith is the standard. And, and if Rome is getting some stuff right and, and I end up changing my mind to fit with the deposit of faith, well, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> you know? And so, so you, you referenced uh, uh, quite a bit of uh, church history and the role that history plays for you. Right? And, and you have training as a historian as well. And so yeah, not, not, not quite like, not quite like here's a course on how to do history 101, but like yeah. a, a kind of around that during my bachelor of theology, we would learn principles of historical method yes. interpretation. Um, and, but then I think in my opinion, the vast majority of my learning has come like after my bachelor. Yeah. And so I do my own study, buy my own books on historical method, read them, assimilate them, put it into practice and all that. Yeah. Well, and, and so, in that in that way, you do have a little bit of that training in school, and then what I, I think you're right. What ends up happening a lot is you just you get like the building blocks of how to learn uh, in school a lot of the time, and then mm. you can just build that out exactly and, yeah. and keep learning after that. But so we talk a little about church history. So uh, why don't you tell us who some of your favorite church fathers are, and then oh. maybe share some uh, fathers' writings that really <laughs> really helped you uh, when it comes to mm. being convinced of the fundamental claims of Anglicanism uh, versus those of Rome. Mm, yeah. Okay. So this one's very interesting for me because I'm not going to have the usual list of fathers that people will often get. So, some are, that I will list, others will often have, but others definitely not. Um, in terms of my favorite church fathers, and a couple of them in particular are probably going to be a bit controversial. Um, so people will normally list like, oh, Athanasius, oh, Augustine, oh, Chrysostom. It's like, uh, there's a reason why a lot of people slide them. They're absolute giants of the faith, absolute yeah. giants. Um, but for me in particular, uh, I, I have a very particular, because uh, this is kind of the first time I, I, when you actually gave these questions, kind of the first time I had to think of like a definitive list. And I wouldn't even say a definitive list right yeah. now still, but even just a list of who's my favorite church fathers, you know, um, and so for me, my favorites tend to go around 
those who are the earliest and most profound in the earliest ages, um, but also those who are profound even in other er- in, uh, in later ages, but for different reasons. So my list, so prepare for the spice. So my list starts with uh, Clement of Rome slash the Roman Presbyteral College in First Clement, because I do believe First Clement was written by the Collective Church of Rome, not just by Clement himself. So anyway, for the sake of simplicity, Clement of Rome, Ignatius of Antioch, Irenaeus of, of Leon, Origen, yes, he's a father, Eusebius of Caesarea, yes, he's a father, and Hilary of Poitiers. Um, so a bit of a schizophrenic list there. So why? Why, why them? So Clement, Ignatius, and Irenaeus in particular, because they were very early and foundational giants of the faith, they are key witnesses to the life and teachings of the apostles. So they have a genuinely like greater authority that the later fathers just couldn't have, it's just simply by the fact of their removal in time. Um, and so, and Clement in particular, with First Clement, that letter is absolutely amazing, completely beautiful orthodox doctrine, amazing exposition of the Old Testament, of Pauline theology, uh, direct contemporary with the Apostle Paul. How much better could you ask for, really, of a non-biblical text? And so that letter is so profound for me. Like, I genuinely consider that letter as the prime example of truly authoritative extra-biblical tradition because when we do biblical interpretation, like biblical interpretation 101, it's like, oh, look at historical context. Look at how different sources use the same words and ideas and what have you. And those other sources... Um, Sorry, you cut out there for like 20 seconds. So you, you said... You said you said that... Um, uh, uh, you, one of the first things you're taught when you're doing exegesis is to mm. look at historical sources. And so you can look yeah. at Clement of Rome and that's where you cut out. Exactly. So yeah, one of the first things you're taught in biblical exegesis um, is to look at contemporary sources, how they use the same language, how they use the same concepts, and you use that to interpret the scriptures because it's in the same historical context. And so that helps you inform what the scriptures are actually saying. And so in a way, those other sources that we use, even as sole scriptura Protestants in our seminaries, that, that is, those other sources are, in a way, authorities in how to interpret the Bible. And so you just need to simply apply that thinking to the earliest church fathers, and especially, again, First Clement, because that was written by direct contemporaries of the apostles. They, uh, In Irenaeus' own words, Clement had the teaching of the apostles ringing in his ears still. And so what, how they read and interpret what the apostles preach, it's truly authoritative because it's from the very people whom they taught in the most direct sense. And I have actually used First Clement to that effect on at least two different issues. One of them being, believe it or not, the complementarian versus egalitarian issue, because there's actually a couple of passages that are actually very significant for that in interpreting Paul. Um, So yeah, first Clement for that reason. Uh, Ignatius for similar reasons, not as much as Clement, um, but Ignatius for similar reasons, because his letters are just genuinely very profound, very interesting, very uh, great spiritual reading as well. Um, But Irenaeus of Leon, I'll point to him too, because again, very major early witness, huge work from such a early period, massive historical source. And so he says many very interesting things. And Irenaeus has basically become a pet project of mine. I do want to write a book on him one day and how he basically reflects Reformation thought on theological authority. Um, But yeah, that's something I'm genuinely convinced of, that when it comes to thinking about how we ground doctrine, how we prove it, Irenaeus is fundamental is thoroughly on the side of the Reformation and against Rome of the East. So I'm 100 percent convinced of that. I even had a debate with a Romanist on that on um, Alan Rule's channel. It was a very good debate. Um, so I definitely commend people to watch it. And so he's he's become one of my favorites exactly for that because he's very he's he's basically the father of the Reformation in many ways because of what he says about Holy Scripture. Um, things which when I see other Roman apologists, Roman and Eastern apologists try to cope their way around it it's just it's just really funny um so yeah you're an ace for that reason too and he's just a genuinely like profound very biting uh teacher as well in many ways lots of lots of interesting and profound insights on theological matters um now origin um did he have some bad views yeah 100 percent. guess what he's still a father of the church in any meaningful sense because he had a massive influence on those who came after them after him people who would consider him like, oh, there's this great teacher and saint and what have you. You can point to numerous Eastern fathers who were directly influenced by Origen. Um, so, to, so to deny that he's a father of the church just because a later council condemned him, rightly or wrongly, 
that just doesn't work. That's just a straight up denial of reality. Um, and I pick him because of just how influential he was. Um, and he was a genuine ac academic. Like you read his stuff, you can read his commentary on Romans. You can read his response to his response against against Celsus. He is a genuine academic thinker. He is much more academic than arguably a majority of the church fathers. Many of them just weren't academics. Like they they wrote in ways which, for the modern mind, are very profound because we've just lost so much. But many of them just weren't academics. Origen was an academic. He was very very good at what he did. Um, and so he's a very major witness in, in many things. Um, and I likewise point to Eusebius of Caesarea, because again, my, my big thing is history. I love history as a discipline. And Eusebius is rightly called the father of church history. What Herodotus was to regular secular history, Eusebius was to church history. He, uh, he trod on untrodden ground and started the whole genre, basically. Now, arguably, you can point to someone else like, Hegesippus from the second century, but that, those are more memoirs. But before I get into another tangent, yeah, Eusebius was basically the father um, of church history, made very profound contributions in that respect. Without him, we'd know a lot less than we do. Um, and even uh, even his um, even his Trinitarian theology, he gets the accusation of semi Arianism and what have you. Um, I'm still exploring exactly his nuances in that view because. Um, and I'm going to, and I, because the reasons for that, I'm going to explain when I get to Hillary of Poitiers, but I think many fathers and many figures in general in church history, when they're accused of semi-Arianism and like, oh, look at this heretic, they're actually often in the mainstream, believe it or not. Um, and so I don't think Eusebius, I think he gets a bit of a bad rap when it comes to his Trinitarian theology. And he otherwise has some genuinely true insights, um, I with respect to theological matters. Um, so that's why I include him as well as one of my favorites. Now, Lastly, I include Hilary of Poitiers precisely because of his exploration of the Trinitarian theology issue. He is one that people in these debates need to explore a lot more to get an actual perspective on what it was like back then, those debates. People just assume that it was the Arians and the semi-Arians versus the, the Nicene Christians, homoousios, all that jazz. Hilary of Poitiers alone in his... Um, which one uh, on the councils or De Sunodis in, in Latin, it, he completely blows that myth out of the water in spectacular fashion. He explicitly says um, that he doesn't mind people using either homoousios or homoousios like substance with respect to Trinitarian theology. Um, and that both articulations rightly understood are accurate. Um, he explicitly endorses "Quote unquote semi Arians like Basil Van Kyra um, in his council against, uh, which I believe was against um, Sabellians, if I'm not mistaken. It, my memory might be faulting me, but in any case, he shows that um, in those early times there was actually a fair bit of friendliness and an alliance, basically between the pro Nicene party and the Homoi Usians, who are quote unquote semi Arian." And what Hillary shows is that actually um, there was in the pro-Nicene fathers a much greater emphasis on the monarchy of the father and that it wasn't just this flat equality between father, son, and spirit, but that there was in a genuine way that was still Trinitarian and still preserved the deity of the son, there was still nonetheless some sense of a hierarchy. Like Hillary would explicitly say the son submits to the father, the son does not appear to the father, and when I actually um, showed that paragraph to, a, to an, uh, an Anglican friend here in Sydney who's very concerned with um, Trinitarian theology, he's very much against, um, like, for example, the eternal subordination debate and all that. When I showed him that paragraph from Hillary that commonly called, remember, he's commonly called the Athanasius of the West for a reason, okay? Major Trinitarian father for the West, universally respected on that matter. I show him that particular paragraph from Hillary's On the Councils where he, he very bluntly speaks of the son's subordination to the father. And I asked my mate, I asked my mate, if you heard that paragraph from just any other random bloke, what would you think? He, he said, I would be very concerned. I would be disturbed. I would be disturbed hearing that from anyone else. Um, and so that's why I include Hillary, because he gives people, I think, some much needed perspective on Trinitarian theology, that it's not as simple as many people think. Um, and he and, and Hillary has, in, in a way, he's kind of 
confirm some of my own suspicions where I do, I do personally have a much greater uh, emphasis on the monarchy of the father. And I'm okay with submission and subordination language rightly understood when it comes to the son and the spirit. And I think Hillary just confirms that quite beautifully. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, uh, so one, one of the reasons I like to ask this question, uh, is, uh, well, a, I also just like finding out people's favorite <laughs> church politics and Trump's writings are, but also B, um, I think it's good to be able to demonstrate that, uh, uh you know, you can have a uh, deep knowledge and appreciation of the fathers for a lot of different reasons. Um, uh, and again, and yet you don't have to jump to Rome or to the East to do that, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And, and so now when it comes to, to studying the fathers, like what role did, uh, you know, the study of the fathers actually have in your evaluation of Rome, hmm. right? Because I, I, that's one of those, one of those uh, you know, uh, city on a hill, like sort of claims that Rome <laughs> the to make, uh, uh, you know, along with the Coptics and along with er everybody else in the ecclesialist category where they like to make the whole, you know, where the one true apostolic church and the fathers, like it, you know, this, this is a, a pop polemic, but in a lot of the pop yeah. polemics, you hear a lot of this, like, you know, the, the unanimous consensus of the fathers, the unanimous consensus of the fathers on, on everything from the papacy to, to, to things there's actually seems to be consensus on uh, regarding baptism and, and, and other areas. And so how did your study of the fathers uh, help you deal with that polemic and that kind of attitude? Oh, yeah, it was it was pretty much quicksand. The more I'd study the fathers, the the worse and worse we'd get for, in my opinion, Roman and Eastern claims. Um, they present a very cl simple, clear and clean narrative. And then I get into the fathers and it's a lot of mud in the sense of they say many different things. They say things that one side says, they say things that another side says, they say things that both sides say, they say things that neither side says um, on all sorts of issues. And so the more I dug and the more I continue to, 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 to dig to this day, the more I find that, well, no, Rome's claim to be, oh, look, we're the true church of the early church or the East claims likewise. It's just not true. Like we can think of big issues like whole icon veneration, for example, where um, Rome, Romanists like to at least admit, well, like, yeah, well, there was development, you know, but the Easterners, they... The Eastern apologists in particular, they like to do a lot of cope around the, the issue of icon veneration um, and how it's very clearly not accepted in the earliest times. Um, ditto with a number of other issues. <clears throat> I would even find more niche events like the Miletian Schism and how that was that event alone is basically a death blow to the papacy um, because you do quite literally have a quote-unquote schismatic bishop winning against the Bishop of Rome and the Bishop of Rome capitulating to him. Uh, into his claim. Um, and the rest of the church was basically saying, hey, Rome, we just just chill out, okay? And and they're not just immediately bowing to, to Rome in that situation. Um, and even more recently, my, my more recent project has been actually studying the, uh, the nature of the empire in the church in the post-Constantinian era. And just the more and more I've dug into that, the more I've basically seen that's only confirmed even further that this idea of the of this great church magisterium. It was just, oh, look, the church decreed things and it was just objectively clear to everyone. It's like, uh, yeah, no, it was actually an imperial organ. <laughs> That's actually the, the, the very origins. I mean, I knew this before, but studying this more directly, it's become the significance of that has become even more manifest. The ecumenical council, that wasn't a divine institution. That was an imperial project. It, it was a good one. I'm a hundred percent for like, I'm, I, I'm an Anglican and I've, I used to be totally against the Rastianism, but now I'm kind of quite sympathetic to it. I'm, I, I won't say that directly just because I, I want to actually read more details just in case things are missing out. But in terms of the basic premise of the state playing an active role in ensuring the proper state of the church, I'm 100% for that. And so I was 100, I'm 100% for what Constantine did. I'm 100% for what the uh, Theodosius did with establishing Nicene Christianity as the state religion of the empire. I'm actually 100% for those things. The issue is when Rome and the East suddenly take those things and now they claim they're of divine authority as if God himself established them when he didn't, at least not in the sense of he didn't give revelation through Christ and say, thus says the Lord, I'm establishing my infallible organ here. That just didn't happen. It came, um, granted, we could, we, could, we could grant that it came from the guidance of the spirit, but only in a post facto sense. In the end, it was 
it was the interests and the motives of emperors that did those things. Um, and that's really where the origin of a universal church magisterium comes from. It fundamentally comes not from Christ and the apostles. It comes from the empire. And again, it was a great thing. It did much good things. It, it, it established the stable foundation of the faith, which we rest on to this day in a practical sense. But in the end, it was still a human thing. Um, and so that latest project, uh, which I'm going more and more into, especially with the Theodosian Code, like it's actually incredible when you read um, just the extent of imperial law over the church, how much power they assumed for themselves. Even, even the power to just decree this sect is heretical, their bishops are, are, are gone. They, they don't have valid bishops. Just like, you would think this is the Pope talking. But no, nah, it's the, it's the flipping emperor, <laughs> and and so that project in, in particular has only further confirmed that Roman and Eastern ecclesiology is an evolution from historical revisionism. Yeah, and and I will say that's one of the things that for me, um, and, and again, I'm I'm not a, a history buff yet. The hope is <laughs> the hope is to build up one to day, it. Mate, one day, uh, one day, but. Um, uh, that's something that, that that interests me a lot as well is for me learning a lot more about the Reformation and learning a lot more about uh, a, a lot of the things that were going on there is, you know, the first layer of that is like, okay, let's look at all the big players. Let's look at the big ideologies. And it's almost like the first layer is, well, everyone is just purely standing on principle all the time. And they're purely like, this is just an ideological like movement. But then when you move uh, to like, even just one level past that, then you start seeing like, well, wait a minute, but, Sure, like even for example, with the with the, the the Lutherans and the Reformation, it's like sure you have princes that they do seem to be convinced with the Lutheran cause, but they also have significant incentive to be involved in in uh, politically against uh, the Holy Roman Emperor, right? You have um, sometimes things that appear like people changing their stances on things depending on the situations, right? You have uh, part of the reason that Phil, uh, that Philip Melanchthon is not uh, re uh, you know remembered. Uh, in the most uh, rosy of ways by, by Lutherans today, even though I love, uh, and, and most Lutherans do love Melanchthon's early stuff, is you see Melanchthon, you know, once the, the small Caldic League is is broken by the Holy Roman Emperor's forces, Melanchthon's suddenly like, hey guys, like, you know, maybe it's not that big of a deal if they make us worship in the Roman manner in the mass, <laughs> right? And he's like, and it's, and he has a lot more of like this live to fight another day, <laughs> like, like sort of mentality when that happens. And, and no one's perfect, you know, and, and everyone, and, and we're all sinners, people succumb to different things. Uh, but it's interesting for me, even, uh, you know, not being like, like this massive history buff, you just start looking into stuff and you're like, well, sometimes you have a lot of political interests that, 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 you know, uh, really are things that are moving movements and the things that are doing uh, uh, a lot of uh, what is behind a lot of these big events of orthodoxy right in history you have sometimes uh, personal interests that people have or even sometimes personal relationships right I, I mean like uh, again with the Reformation uh, you see uh, Luther when Melanchthon suddenly a lot more okay with the will not being necessarily completely in bondage or when Melanchthon is maybe more okay with the reform view of the supper Luther will never write against them Right. And it's like, you know, like, well, how could this be? Like Luther feels so strongly on these issues. He goes, they're, it's because they were friends. <laughs> right. And, <laughs> and when you're friend, like, it's something that practical, like it, it, it changes the way that you act and the way that you do things. And I think the same is true for the fathers, because I, I would say one of the big things uh, which which uh, you were talking about is, you know, this this idea of everyone's just purely acting in this black and white, like standing on principles and standing on on the truth sort of way. And that's just not true <laughs> when you look at history, right? <laughs> um, and, and but there's there's also this level of, you know, you look you look at history and 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 there's just there's just there's there's so much complexity there and so many things that you have to keep in mind when it comes to properly evaluating these things. And, yeah, and I think cool. a lot of it, uh, which is something you talk about a lot, a lot of it just goes back to looking at the primary sources mm -hmm. and actually looking at what they're saying, looking at what they're not saying, very importantly, as well. Um, and, and it, it it breaks this myth also that the church fathers and no one says this, but it's it's really what's behind. I feel like uh, the spirit of a lot of the conversations and the circles that we run in is you have people that will like they'll have some super what seems like a super far out of left field take, and you're like, where did this come from? Oh, but father so and so said it, and it's like, okay, well we have to have more than just that, <laughs> right? It's like, it's like these guys are people too, you know, like they're not they're not they're not the 
the the mouthpiece of the Holy Spirit on every yeah, issue. Exactly. You know, like, 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 oh wow, Ephraim the Syrian said this one thing in this hymn of his. Yeah, say it's the Lord. <laughs> yeah. Okay? yeah. And, and you see that leak into so many different issues, and it, and it's like, you know, we gotta we gotta like we gotta respect our our, our forefathers, or we gotta respect the church fathers, absolutely, and and we should respect. I would say, obviously, for us, uh, the reformers. <laughs> right? We have we have a lot of people that that ran the the race of faith and finished strong that came before us that we should respect, but they're also not infallible, and they're not mm -hmm. they're not people that will just be com walk around completely uninfluenced by their day or completely uninfluenced by the political forces that are around <laughs> you know and and so well to that I, I mentioned quite a bit here in uh, uh in that bit about the the reformers and so you mentioned mm. a few of your favorite church fathers right so who are a few of your favorite reformers and which of their mm. writings in particular that you find most helpful when you're evaluating rome and mm. and getting into this debate yeah, I have to give an honorable shout out to, to Martin Chemnitz because his section in volume two of the examination of the Council of Trent on the different types of tradition, that really is, that it's very difficult to overstate the importance of that part of the work just as a simple demonstration of the, of the multivariate nature of such a key concept that Rome and the East rely on against the Reformation. And that, no, actually, not only did the Reformation recognize this concept, they're actually capable of differentiating different kinds of it, where they would say that we accept the vast majority of it. It's just this particular sense that you guys assert that we don't accept. Um, so it's a brilliant, 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 brilliant piece in that respect. Um, but otherwise, in more recent months, I've been diving into the, the great Anglican tradition, uh, including the more commonly known authors like John Jewell and Richard Hooper, for example, but even more niche authors that uh, I'm increasingly getting more and more into niche Anglican authors who have great things to say, yet very few people happen to know about, um, such as Richard Field. And the significance for him, uh, I don't know if you uh, if, if you know Javier, but if anyone else watching as well, um, so Richard Hooker, his Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity, massive, massive, massive Anglican work, very significant basically a massive, massive work against the Puritans. What the laws of ecclesiastical polity was to the Puritans, Richard Field's work of the church was to the Romanists. So it was a huge work. The, the, uh, the digital edition I have downloaded is a photo scan of an edition from like the 19th century, and it's four volumes, 2,000 pages long. It's massive. It's a colossal work, covers tons and tons of issues in very granular detail uh, against Rome. It's a, it's got a very, very high Anglican perspective, uh, maybe a little bit high for my liking on certain matters, but otherwise it's got very, very solid critiques and lots of fantastic detail. It draws from the church fathers very frequently from Holy scripture employs very, very uh, precise language, very precise logic. Um, even especially the section on, um, on private judgment, you know, cause that's a big issue that's uh, mm -hmm. around us. And actually that's a stream that I'll be hosting between yep. uh, River Devereux and Jonah Seller in approximately eight and a half hours from now. Yay. Oh, okay. for them. <laughs> but in any case, um, he, he actually even has a whole chapter on that and he makes really good and brilliant distinctions in that matter. Um, and so yeah, him, uh, but again, even a more co uh, common work, John Jewell's Apology for the Church of England, fantastic standard Anglican work uh, responding to Rome on a number of issues. Um, uh, so that one, uh, Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity, already mentioned, very detailed in, in defense of Anglican worship in particular, among other things. Um, yeah, lo lots and lots of different works. A uh, major one that one of my Sydney Anglican friends just sent to me um, is this absolutely colossal 18 volume work called A Preservative Against Popery um, from the early 18th century. And it's literally just a massive compilation of prior Anglican works um, against Rome on pretty much all topics from what I've seen just by a brief survey of it. Um, but one of the works it has, so in volume five, book three, um, on tradition, it has one work by a certain Bishop Simon Patrick from the 17th century, and it's called A Discourse on Tradition. And I only read that recently, and it is, in my opinion, the 
greatest, most perfect articulation of a truly reformational, patristic, and particularly Anglican view of tradition in relation to scripture. It's incredible. That, that is basically the standard work I'm going to cite. If people want my opinion on the nature of the authority of tradition and reconciled with Sola Scriptura as well, um, I, I point to that work. It's absolutely a, a thing of brilliance. Um, likewise, even Thomas Cranmer's True and Catholic Doctrine of the Lord's Supper, extremely detailed on patristic testimony as well on the Lord's Supper. Um, there's just too many different works to count, really. So I just kind of just throwing names out here and there on different matters. And if you notice, almost all of my Anglicans, Anglicans because that's pretty much where my focus is in the moment. Um, obviously, there's great other works by various other Lutherans and Continental Reformed in particular. Um, but yeah, the Anglicans are my focus. And so I decided to give them a bit of a shout out. Yeah. Well, and I, I, let me also take this opportunity then as, as, as you say that, because um, we referenced it several times. We have to have it on, on, <laughs> on, on this uh interview uh explain real quick like the 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 couple minute version of you know as you're talking about like oh obviously you're giving anglican works you're an anglican right mm -hmm. what is the issue that we talk about all the time with uh this this whole word protestant that gets thrown around in these debates right because now you and i have a slightly different take on the the mm -hmm. utility of the word because i still use it <laughs> yeah, but uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about that but um what is i guess describe the problem uh, with the way this word is used in, in the Roman Catholic Protestant debate. Yes. So the problem with the word Protestant is it's essentially malleable nature. Um, in today's context, it can mean anything from just Lutherans to the Mormons. It, it's, it's, it's an insanely malleable term. Um, and it's, and it's thus a very dishonest one because it refers to in virtually any, in almost every definition, it refers to at least two or more separate traditions under an umbrella that share some common premises. Um, and what's dishonest about that is that they compare this to a singular defined tradition like Rome or the East. And the problem with that is obvious because that's because the, that, that reliance on the term Protestantism is where Rome and the East get a lot of their arguments about, Oh, look, you guys are disunited. You can't even agree on the doctrines together. Yeah. Therefore, Protestantism debunked. Uh, and that is why I came up a while ago with my, well, apparently it seems to be taken on steam now, my, uh, my, counter, uh, my counter concept of ecclesialism, where I tried to just say, okay, let's, let's apply equal weights and measures here. I'm going to create the concept of ecclesialism, which groups together Rome, the East, the Orientals, throw them all in there. Um, so basically an equivalent concept to Protestantism, just on the other side. And hey, oh, look at that. The same arguments for disunity can be applied there. Hey, look, your great and infallible church can't even inform unity between Rome, the East, Orientals, the Set of Acantis, Most Holy Family, Monastery, the Palmyrene Church, you name it. Um, and so and so that just completely shows just how rubbish and dishonest of a term Protestantism is precisely because it doesn't refer to anything specific. It's literally nothing. It's an abstraction. It's a pure abstraction now. Back in the day, there was maybe some meaning to it. Like you'd hear, obviously, classical Reformation authors, they'll refer to themselves as Protestant. That's because it was a much more defined thing. It was very concretely referring to themselves, Lutherans, etc. But now it's just a completely meaningless term. And so it's, 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 it carries a lot more negative baggage than positive. And so that's why I just completely endorse where, look, we can defend... There's two things you can defend. If you want to defend something that's common to our different traditions, defend the Reformation because that is a definite time and place and mm -hmm. peoples and traditions there. Um, or more importantly, defend your own specific tradition because that's ultimately what you are. You are not properly speaking a Protestant. No one is properly speaking a Protestant. There isn't the Protestant church. I don't have a Protestant church in my city. There's no church called the Protestant church. There are Anglican churches, there's Presbyterian churches, there's Baptist churches, there's Reformed churches, there's Hillsong churches, there's churches of Latter-day Saints, there's Kingdom Halls. There's no Protestant church. That doesn't exist. And so that's why I completely endorse that people just defend your own tradition as it is, um, especially because, like, look, if you're in that tradition, you ipso facto believe it is the most faithful um, expression of the Christian faith. So act like it. Act like it is. That's why I stay an Anglican, and that's why I assert, I personally assert, the Anglican way as the true, uh, the true way of the Christian faith.
Yeah, for sure. And and we've talked about this plenty of times before. Um, to you know, uh, summarize what you just said, it's, it's just yeah, Protestantism is just an umbrella term, right? It's an umbrella term mm-hmm. the same way that monotheism is is an umbrella yeah. term that's yeah. abstracted yeah. out on some principles, right? Or, or polytheism. And so what I always say um, is is and I would agree with with most of what you've said here, right? I would agree that uh, we need to defend our own traditions, right? And once we're like you know, and it's okay if we're not like fully, fully yet settled into something, right? To, to not, I guess, have the branding on, on everything. But once I feel like uh, we're settled into something, it's, it's we should just defend what our tradition is because, you know, there, there's definitely some value to defending the umbrella, right? If, like, for example, we can make arguments about why monotheism is more structurally sound uh, sure. as an idea yeah. than, than polytheism. And that's, and that's all, all fine and dandy, right? That's great. But like you're saying, uh, to give a, I'll give the monotheism example because it, it gives a good parallel to what you're saying is mm. there is no such thing as monotheist churches, right? And, and, yeah. it, and we would all understand how goofy it would be if the polytheist side was like, oh, but you monotheists cannot even agree on who's the right God. Is it Allah? Is it Yahweh? Is it like that? That's a silly argument, right? But then yeah. and we could see right through that. But if our uh, Roman Catholic friends, or Eastern Orthodox friends or ecclesialist friends say, oh, but you Protestants cannot even agree. Then it's like then suddenly that creates a lot of anxiety. Why? <laughs> That's not. It's not. It's it's not the same. It, it's yep. it's literally the same objection as the as the polytheist being like you monotheist can't even agree on on what God uh, to serve. And so, I think now for me personally, I don't do away with the term entirely because I do think there's a there's a benefit to protecting the umbrella. Um, but at the same time, I, I would agree with you that you know once we start doing like. Uh, a Protestant everything, and we just never defend our own traditions, or we never specify exactly. what we're talking about. That's that's a big detriment. Yeah, and, and that's how the the as again, as much as I I love Trent Horn and some of the the content of the guys on that side, that's why the Catholic Answers Crew can get away so much with just yeah, saying exactly. one question Protestants can't answer, and they're just mm. talking about non denominationals, Baptists, mm. and like <laughs> and like Pentecostals, right? And, and, and so. And that's how they get away with that. Or it's like, like the one question they can't answer, why, the, the, why, how come you Protestants can't do X, Y, or Z? It's like, well, because like I always say, there's no institutional unity in things that are not institutions. Exactly. <laughs> right? And so yeah. if we look at monotheism, monotheism is not an institution. So it's not going to have institutional unity. Right? And Protestantism is not an institution. And so it's not going to have institutional unity. Like you said before, what, what is an institution are, is like the LCMS, right? The ACNA. Yeah. The, the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, these are exactly. institutions. And so if we yeah. want to compare uh, one institution to another, we should do that. Or if we want to compare an umbrella to another umbrella, that's okay, as long as we <laughs> actually do that, because yeah, Rome's not right. an umbrella, so why would we compare it to, to an umbrella? But if exactly. we want to compare ecclesialism to Protestantism, I mean, we could do that, right? And then that, that breeds some interesting discussion. But I, I just think we have to be honest in the in the terminology. You know? Absolutely, absolutely. And so, so with that, as I transition here to the final uh, couple of questions, right? So we're talking about the importance of uh, individual traditions and, and defending and, and expounding our individual traditions. And so what about being an Anglican do you find to be uniquely special uh, in, in, com- in comparison with other Protestant uh, traditions under that umbrella? Yep. The beauty of the Anglican tradition that I came to find uh, after entering into it pure providential thing, as I explained a bit earlier, is it, it really can make the claim to be tr- to being the truly representative of the Catholic and the apostolic faith. Um, and it fulfills that Reformation era dictum, which is often attributed to Augustine. And admittedly, I used to think that too, but it's, it's actually from the Reformation, which says, in necessaris unitas, in non necessaris libertas, in omnibus caritas. That is, in the necessities, unity, in non-necessities, liberty, and all things, charity. The Anglican tradition fulfills that beautifully with our simplicity of doctrine. It, it's both simple and yet firm and clearly defined what we believe with the 39 Articles of Religion and the Book of Common Prayer in particular. And even with the Book of Common Prayer itself just being simply one of the greatest, if not the greatest liturgy out there, bar none, simple as that. Um beautiful, purely biblical tapestry woven into a liturgical context. Um, but yeah, again, that, because it is a doctrinal standard, so combine that with the 39 articles, and you have a beautiful summary of the true Christian faith, which, um, unlike the Book of Concord and the Westminster Confession of Faith, 
Um, it doesn't bind people to such overly granular and specific doctrinal assertions that are just plainly just not necessary. Um, and that's where I think a number of when when that's con when a number of Presbyterians, for example, or the Lutherans are confronted with that, like why do people need to believe in this extremely specific metaphysical assertion of the real presence in the Eucharist, like this very particular assertion in the Book of, Con uh, Book of Concord? Um, or why, or for the Westminster Confession, why do people need to believe in this very particular idea of predestination or the um, or the atonement and its extent? Um, why must that happen? And there's and you'll get the arguments like, oh, well, it's true and it follows by consequences. Like, yeah, but like you can follow anything out to endless lines of what follows by consequence, but we're not going to bind people to everything that's logically necessary. That's literally impossible to do. Um, and so I believe the 39 articles in the Book of Common Prayer, they provide that brilliant baseline of just what is the true faith. Um, and that combined with the global Episcopal structure of the Anglican Church, it provides truly the best platform by which we can achieve a true pan-Reformation and God willing, maybe even one day pan-Christian unity. unity. Um, and so I think it's because of that, it's not an accident that really for 400 years since the English Reformation, it was just a, a golden age of Anglican theological and historical and particularly patristic out, uh, uh, output. Countless amazing works by Anglican scholars and theologians on any issue, be it biblical, theological, or patristic, and they're absolute gold mines, and they're used by basically everyone to this day. Um, even arguably the most famous and well-renowned book against the papacy is Papalism by Edward Denny, an Anglican. <laughs> um, and it's, it's, it's well right now for a really good reason. It is a thorough work. And that is, that is the norm in the Anglican traditions, truly long, detailed, thorough, precise works on these issues, truly intellectually fulfilling. Um, and so that's why I, that's why I remain an Anglican. And that's why I assert it as the truest expression of the faith. Cool. Yeah, that's that's one of my 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 favorite questions to ask people uh, is is what you know. It, it's always fascinating for me the the things that are really sticking points for people and the things that they really value. And I think a lot of the time uh, when you're a convinced member of a given tradition, that kind of brings out you know what you find to be really important, right? And uh, when it comes to to, I mean, the faith once for all delivered to the saints and and the proper expression of it. And so with that, uh, I had two final questions for you here. Uh, I was going to ask uh, what inspired you to make uh, content dealing with the claims of Rome. I feel like you kind of touched on that uh, quite a bit already. Uh, if you want to add something to that, you can. Uh, is, is there anything you want to add to that before I just skip over it for the, the final no, question? Yeah, no, not particularly. Pretty much what I already explained. Yeah, I, I thought we covered that pretty well. And so my, my final question, which is a, a two-parter, and it's another one that I also ask uh, uh, almost every single interview, right, is... What is the final word that you would like to give to two groups, right? So group number one would be any Roman Catholics that may be listening and maybe they're considering Anglicanism, right? Maybe they're considering, uh, maybe some, maybe they're looking at the Protestant umbrella even. And they're like, hey, maybe I am convinced with some of the umbrella stuff and I'm interested in looking at the traditions within, right? And so a word for any Roman Catholics that are in that place. And then the second group is a final word for any Protestants who may be listening. Uh, and they're struggling with ecclesial anxiety, right? Maybe for them, it, it wasn't uh, uh, an easy, I'm just going to look into this. Maybe they, they weren't as used to the debate, or maybe they were, and they, it's just not that clear for them. And they're they're really anxious. They're feeling tempted to make the jump over to Rome. And so what would you say to uh, those two groups of people? Absolutely. So to doubting Romanists first, I would first say, one, don't be anxious about it. Because, like, yeah, I get it. I was there. Perfectly normal to be very anxious about losing your faith or fundamentally about to change it. Uh, and that's totally understandable. And you should be anxious if you're about to become an atheist, uh, as I, as I, well, I wasn't going to become an atheist, just a non-Christian. Um, but with this case, if you're a, a doubting Romanist and you're thinking, Oh, you know what? These Protestants or these Anglicans, they have a point. Um, don't, don't be anxious about that. You're, it's not something, not going to lose something. You will lose the papacy and other dogmas and what have you. But it's going to be for gaining something as well. You're not going to be ending, and you're not going to the pit of despair of atheism. You're going to, um, as your own conscience is telling you, the truer expression of the Christian faith. And so you should actually be rejoicing at that. So um, be excited that you're potentially discovering 
the fuller expression of the of the true Christian faith. Um, second, don't consider Protestantism as a single entity. Go to the traditions themselves, study them deeply, and see which one is the true expression of the Christian faith, Anglicanism. Uh, and number three, um, well, yeah, look at the Anglican traditions specifically. I'm, I'm, I'm obviously going to say that because I believe it's true. Um, and so if you want any advice on that, if you want or, or have any other related questions to that, shoot me over an email, the other Paul 64 at gmail.com. So that's what I say for doubting Romanists. Um, now for doubting Protestants, quote unquote, um, dealing with ecclesial anxiety. So first do what I did, take some study in interpreting texts, even just biblical exegesis, because you can apply that to other texts as well. Uh, hermeneutics, uh, historical method, being able to think critically and systematically and, and methodologically or methodically rather through older and ancient texts um, such that you just don't take for granted the assertions that Romanists and Easterners make about these. Like, oh, the church fathers all said this, or oh, the ancient church always believed that. And oh, you Protestants believe the church was wrong for 12 gorillion years until Martin Luther came and saved everything. No, don't take those claims for granted. Don't, no, no, no matter how intimidating they may appear, because that's a big thing that happens. That's, that's a big thing that pulled me to closer to apostasy was just seemingly how intellectually intimidating my opponents were. They were like, look, they've read so much more than me. They're, they're very sophisticated in their language. Maybe they're right. I don't know how to counteract them. Just you, It may take some time, but just brute force block that out of your head because all people make mistakes. It doesn't matter how smart or how many degrees or funny hats someone has, they can make mistakes. And in fact, in my experience, it's often PhDs and MDivs who make the most hilarious of mistakes on the very issues that they're studying. Um, so whoever it is, don't be intimidated by them intellectually. Subject them to the same st standards of critical thinking, historical method, and what have you that they expect you to follow and that you would subject anything else to. So don't take their claims for granted. Assess the primary sources yourselves that they provide to see the actual truth. Um, but even more fundamentally than that, block out all that clutter and especially, so especially if you're having the anxiety part, meditate on the very words of Christ and his apostles themselves, which we have, you have it in your possession. You don't need Rome or the East to access it. If they want to control it, they can cry harder because they can't. Okay. You have access to those very words in book form, digital form, anything. And in particular, um, one biblical passage that I've seriously taken to heart a lot more now, because I, I used to be much more just cold academic and to my own detriment, not really take a huge amount of stock in the more spiritual, um, comforting words of scripture. But now I am taking it much more seriously um, to the point where I kind of, I actually kind of want to go back to my old younger days where I'd write like stories and all that. I, I'm kind of thinking of writing a novel that kind of follows a character going through the very issue of ecclesial anxiety and the beginning and the end, I basically bookended by him hearing a sermon like a year or two apart on the same passage, which I commend to everybody else with ecclesial anxiety. And that is of course, let me quickly, I should have done it beforehand. Matthew chapter 11 verses 28 to 30 which says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It is that simple. Those are the words of the Savior to you, uh, because that is fundamentally what his faith is. It is supposed to not be something that gives you anxiety. It's not supposed to be something that weighs you down and causes you to despair of these things. It's, it's supposed to be the exact opposite. It's supposed to give you a lighter burden. And how does Christ give you that light and easy burden and easy yoke? How does he do that? <clears throat> he gives that to you by the assurance that you have in his sacrifice through faith, which itself is further given assurance through the sacraments, through baptism and through the Eucharist. And especially once I gained that appreciation for the Eucharist in particular, where when I go up to the altar, when I, maybe that's not the context for you, but in my context, we go to the, to the altar rail, I kneel before it, 
and the priests, they don't like that term, they're very reformed Anglican, but the priests, I'll still call them that, um, we have we get the wine and they tell us, drink this blood which was shed for you, and they give us the bread, eat this bread, this body that was broken for you. And I remember that, hey, in some real and mystical sense, um, putting aside all the debates on metaphysics, because Richard Hooker himself actually says it, I wish people would meditate more on the mystery of the Eucharist than how it works. And that's exactly what you should do. That's a perfect thing because that's a massive thing for many people with ecclesial anxiety. What's even the nature of the Eucharist? Put that to the side. Just acknowledge that something real is happening with it. There's real assurance that you received in partaking of it. And you drink that wine and you eat that bread and through it, your faith it, it is reinforced with that assurance that this sacrifice of Christ truly applies to me, that wherever I am right now, wherever I will be in the future, by God's grace, I will still be in his arms because it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And that is why you should not have any ecclesial anxiety as you study these matters. Yeah, I think, I think that's great. I, I think a lot of the time... Uh, you know, it's easy to get caught up in uh, what is the right tradition and, what, and, you know, fair enough, right? That, that, that is something that yeah. we should uh, uh, really care about and, and look deeply. And there's a lot on, at stake, fair enough. Uh, but at the end of the day, we also need to cling to Christ. Mm -hmm. right? and, and, exactly. yeah. um, and I just want to, I want to, I want to second what you're saying. It's, uh, I was reading a, a quote from Luther the other day. Um, actually, I, I also probably should have had this uh, uh, <laughs> pulled up, but <laughs> if I can just real quick uh, pull it up here, uh, Luther says the following regarding um, uh, finding uh, forgiveness of sins. So he's writing against, if I remember correctly, I think it's, yeah, so it's the, the work is called Against the Heavenly Prophets, and he's defending his view of, of the sacraments. And he says this, quote, so that our readers may the better perceive our teaching, I shall clearly and broadly describe it. We treated the forgiveness of sins in two ways. First, how it is achieved and won. Second, how it is distributed and given to us. Christ has achieved it on the cross, it is true, but he has not distributed or given it on the cross. He has not won it in the supper or the sacrament. There he has distributed and given it through the word, as also in the gospel where it is preached. He has won it once for all on the cross, but the distribution takes place continuously before and after from the beginning to the end of the world. For inasmuch as he had determined once to achieve it, it made no difference to him whether he distributed it before or after through his word, as can easily be proved from scripture. But now there is neither need nor time to do so. If now I seek the forgiveness of sins, I do not run to the cross, for I will not find it given there. Nor must I hold to the suffering of Christ, as Dr. Karlstadt trifles, in, not, in, in mere knowledge or remembrance, for I will not find it there either. But I will find it in the sacrament or gospel, the word which distributes, presents, offers, and gives to me that forgiveness which is won on the cross. Therefore, Luther has rightly taught that whoever has a bad conscience from his sins should go to the sacrament and obtain comfort, not because of the bread and wine, not because of the body and blood of Christ, but because of the word which in the sacrament offers, presents, and gives the body and blood of Christ, given and shed for me. Amen. And so... Long way of saying, <laughs> I want to commend that, right? We should cast ourselves and our worries on Christ. Mm -hmm. We should cast our, our, our worries and everything on him. At, and even as he reveals himself in his sacraments, uh, I mm -hmm. would say, uh, I guess for my Baptist listeners that are like, no, have you? <laughs> but but, but I, I, I that. <laughs> And yeah, so, hey, brother, as always, uh, it's uh, it's been great having you, I think, for the first time here on the channel. So this was a great conversation. So, yeah. I really appreciate you sharing your story, coming on and, and talking about this really important subject. Is there anything else that you want to plug uh, that you have coming out? You have your interview coming up. I guess I think that will be released before I release this. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. So at the time of recording, that interview is going to be happening in a little over eight hours from now. So I've got to get some sleep in before then. <laughs> um, but that's going to be, yeah, that's with... Well, people know of it ahead of time anyway, so whatever. So that's with Jonah Sala and uh, now Reverend River Devereaux um, on private judgment and the Anglican tradition. Um, but otherwise, apart from that, uh, yeah, you can subscribe to my channel, The Other Paul. You can go to my website, theotherpaul64.com. Um, support me on Locals so I can make it into a job, basically. 
this this stuff. Same um, here. Viewers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I always forget the plug that, but yes, uh, yeah. Uh, that's that's it. incredibly important for what we're doing. Hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. That's right. So, also, and, so, uh, I'll say I'll link uh, your channel in the description, and I'll also link uh, uh, a list of recommended uh, books, recommended reading for people beautiful. that, that want to dive into it. Well. Um, and I'll also plug. I don't think I've actually like I've, I've mentioned online before, but not as like a full on plug. I'll plug my upcoming book on how to read the Church Fathers. I want it to be something that's truly comprehensive as a resource particularly for quote unquote Protestants. Um, but even something which is useful for Romanists and Eastern readers too, um, if they can just get past the cheeky polemics I occasionally give in there. So, um, so yeah, uh, that's, that's coming. Um, I don't have a release window. I'm about 50 pages done so far. Um, but I estimate it will probably be at least over 200 pages, uh, when it's done, pro- pro- almost certainly larger than that. Because I do really want to go from like first principles all the way up to like the argumentative stage and everything in between. So yeah, that'll be happening. And that's that's me. That's me right now. Cool. All right. Well, as always, uh, thank you so much for coming on, Paul. And hopefully maybe we can do more stuff together, have you on the channel uh, okay. uh, in the future as well. So all right. See you, brother. God bless. Bye.